ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ದಿ ಆನ್ಲೈನ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಷನ್ ಆರ್ಗನೈಸ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ದಿ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಬಾರ್ ಕೌನ್ಸಿಲ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದಿ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಬಾರ್ ಕೌನ್ಸಿಲ್ ಲಾ ಅಕಾಡೆಮಿ ದಿ ಸಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಷನ್ ಇನ್ ಟುಡೇಸ್ ಸೆಮಿನಾರ್ ಅದ ಟೂ ಜಡ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಡಿಲಿವರ್ ಬೈ ದಿ ಹನ್ವಲ್ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಕೋರ್ಟ್ ಡೀಲಿಂಗ್ ವಿತ್ ದಿ ಎಕ್ಸಾಮ್ಷನ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಮ್ಯಾಟರ್ ಆಫ್ ಇನ್ಕಮ್ ಟ್ಯಾಕ್ಸ್ ಟು ದಿ ಎಜುಕೇಷನ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಷನ್ಸ್ ಸಿಮಿಲರ್ ಇಶ್ಯೂ ಈಸ್ ಪೆಂಡಿಂಗ್ ಕನ್ಸಿಡರೇಷನ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ದಿ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ಹೈಕೋರ್ಟ್ and i'll just explain uh, the factual scenario uh, very briefly the for example the city of bangalore consists of the three layers the bangalore metropolitan city then bangalore metropolitan area then bangalore metropolitan region and beyond that are the gram panchayats within bangalore metropolitan region there are several town planning uh, town planning pockets now in 1977 uh 78 uh somewhere uh, during that period the educational institution in northern karnataka sought for exemption from payment of property tax under the karnataka municipalities act on the ground that it was carrying on the charitable activities the matter was discussed at length and there was a judgment delivered by justice rajshekar murthy considering the earlier judgment of the honorable supreme court starting from 1960 onwards saying that and declaring that the educational institutions perform the charitable activities in rendering uh, the human service of uh, imparting education at the rural level and the karnataka high court declared that these schools are exempted from payment of the property tax no after the judgment was delivered by the karnataka high court the karnataka municipalities act was amended excluding the educational institutions from payment of property tax provided they exclusively impart education in the building in the matter of property tax now under the karnataka municipal corporations act section 110 deals with exemption of property tax in respect of educational institutions and it categorically says that the educational institutions which are imparting exclusively educational activities in the building are exempted from payment of property tax provided they are required to pay 25% of the property tax towards the service charges this was under the karnataka municipal corporations act 1976 now as and today the exemption is available under the karnataka municipalities act and karnataka municipal corporations act <coughs> unconditionally provided the entire building is used for educational activities exclusively now 25% is provided for service charges now under the karnataka gram panchayat act which is beyond bengaluru metropolitan region which are bengaluru outside the purview of the municipal corporations now the condition is the institutions or organizations which are uh, carrying on the charitable activities now those are exempted from payment of property tax now the karnataka high court is dealing with the aspect whether the charitable activity includes educational uh, uh, activities imparting education because after the judgment of the honorable supreme court in tmfi foundation education is considered to be wing of charity now that matter is pending before the karnataka high court because several gram panchayats have rejected the applications of the educational institutions on the ground that you are collecting exorbitant fee you are uh, charging capitation fee and you are making profit out of it therefore you are not uh, you are not entitled for exemption under the karnataka panchayat raj act now there is a latest development in in bangalore with the uh, with the legislation uh, bbmp act 2020 now karnataka municipal corporations act 1976 as i indicated earlier section 110 provides for complete exemption of property tax in respect of the educational institutions whose buildings are utilized for educational purposes now bbmp act completely takes away the exemption therefore no one set of schools which are situated in the municipal corporations area and the municipalities area which are entitled for complete exemption <coughs> and educational institutions within bbmp area where the complete exemption is uh, the exemption is completely taken out now this matter is pending before the karnataka high court therefore uh, the uh, the discussion before the karnataka high court in all this litigation would be number one what is the meaning of uh, charitable activity whether the educational institutions imparting uh, education uh, making a profit 
would be considered as uh, doing charitable activities and second one is whether the bbmp act 2020 is constitutionally valid in as much as it makes the distinction between the schools which are situated outside the municipal area and within the municipal uh, corporation area whether there is a discrimination violating, uh, violating article 14 of the constitution of india now these are the issues which are pending consideration the honorable supreme court uh, in inamdar has categorically declared that the engineering or the professional colleges making revenue plus that is a profit for the uh, purpose of running the educational institution and future growth would not come in the meaning of the educational institutions making profit so these are the issues which are pending consideration before the karnataka high court in respect of state schools cbse and icse schools and also international schools now the latest judgment of the supreme court uh, in the two cases uh, will have a direct bearing on the questions which are pending before the karnataka high court hence the seminar uh, mr shankar a senior advocate and one of the leading advocates uh, of the karnataka high court uh, has joined us and gracefully agreed to deliver the lecture on this aspect so i request uh, mr shankar sir to take over and uh, uh, give his uh, lecture thank you basuraj <clears throat> good evening to all am i audible sir yes sir yes sir good evening to all at the very outset i wish to place on record my deep sense of respect and gratitude to my mentor sir sri suresh venkateshan late chartered accountant who has been uh, all pillars in my growth in the field of taxation my respects to him sir and set you down and say something on the topic of the day to initiate a thought process in respect of two decisions that have come under the income tax act as i propose to dwell on such aspects and we have i am given to understand that basuraj will explain to you all the impact of the municipal corporation act be that may income tax act has been a legislation which has undergone changes year after year maybe more than 5 6000 changes must have happened from the 1961 when the act came into picture and the field of taxation in respect of charitable organization is no exception to the same there has been constant amendments to the various sections of the income tax act which is effectively a sort of a competency debate between the tax gatherer and the tax payer the tax gatherer has its object enunciated in parliament explained by way of budget and amendments to the income tax act the tax payer always desires to reduce his taxes in a known manner in lawfully legal manner and consequently relies upon interpretations of the various provisions that have been placed before parliament and approved by way of amendments to income tax charitable organizations have been there much before the 1961 act even under the 1922 act amendments have taken place in 1938 57 before the advent of the 1961 act which we are all concerned for the last 50 years the growth in the field of law in respect of charitable institution has been phenomenal and in fact i had asked one of my colleagues in my office to take the judgments that have been referred to in these two decisions and i am sure people who in the tax side will not be surprised that there are more than 6 volumes and the total number of pages of the decision cited in this particular two decisions runs to more than 1500 or 1600 pages nearing 2000 pages that amount of beautiful, and more than 704 decisions in one and about 22 in decisions in the other 
Effectively, 124 decisions have been cited by various councils of the revenue and the SSE, which has been evaluated in a brilliant manner by the Apex Court and has evolved. People may accept the decision, people have a difference of view on the decision, but I would like to place at the very outset that this judgment, especially the judgment of the Supreme Court in the Ahmedabad Urban Development Authority and others, is, a, is effectively a treatise on the field of taxation, covering all aspects of the law, the issue, the objects, and the various entities. Let's all accept one reality. Income tax is a process by which taxation is made on different entities, different types of people, different classes of people, different statuses under the scheme of the act. It is very effectively analyzed. What is the impact of taxation on statutory bodies like ADB, Mangalore Urban Development Authority, Hassan Urban Development Authority, Ahmedabad Urban Development Authority, and various urban development authorities. Maybe our BDA is not there in the group, but they will also have its own impact on it. Then it has taken sports associations, then it has taken non-statutory bodies, then it has taken private trust, and it has taken trade associations like FIKI, ITPO, KT, KPTO, and it has effectively, and if one were to look at the very index of the judgment, which 146 pages have been very succinctly summarized, and it has been a very treatise to an enjoyable time that I spent during the day, evaluating the same and probably making my submissions in a very easy manner on account of the lucid and succinct way the judgment has been rendered. Be that may. What is the charitable institution's impact on the various bodies that are claiming exemption under the Income Tax Act? Normally, I emphasize normally, most charitable institutions claim exemption under Section 11 and consequently, they are bound by certain condition precedents under Section 13 and they have to get their registrations done under Section 12, 12AA and 12AB, as the case may be. In respect of charitable institutions, in the past, there were occasions when charitable institutions, though their object was A, used to dwell on activities in the nature or akin to business, make surpluses, and use them for charitable activities and claim the exemption under the Income Tax Act. This was allowed for some period up to 78 or 83 as the case may be. Then Amendment 114A came, 13 1BB of the Income Tax Act was withdrawn. And consequently, the concept of business imbibed in a charitable institution was diluted in some manner. And consequently, one cannot say that I will earn money in business, not pay tax at all, but use it for charitable cause. And consequently, I should be given the benefit of exemption. Effectively, the SSC clan, that is SSCs, not the revenue, were harping upon a proposition that what is important for the purpose of granting exemption is not the source of earning the amount, but the application for charitable purpose. So the main process by which exemptions were claimed was, I have earned this money in a fair legal manner. I am applying this for educating poor, medical relief, uh, relief to the poor, object of general public utility, and there are six limbs in section 215, which are now there from 9, 2003 onwards. So I'm spending that, so consequently I should be given the exemption. In fact, at one point of time, the various courts have also held at that point of time, the color of money is not important for the purpose of charity and what is applied for charitable cause is the pith and substance which go in granting exemption under section 11. In this background, the revenue has always been finding methodology by which the taxpayers have been able to 
reduce their incidence of tax on account of the various benefits and explanations and interpretations with the judicial system has come to their support. One of the most important amendments that came around 2008 or 9 is the amendment to the word charity, charitable purpose under section 215 of the Income Tax Act. They clearly brought a proviso to say that if you fall in the limb of object of general public utility. Before that, I will explain stating that charitable purpose effectively had four limbs, medical, relief, education, relief to the poor and object of general public utility. Later, environment, watersheds and a few other aspects have been added, which all fall within the ambit of charitable purpose. Now, the legislature carved out an exception in section 215 of the act by saying that if you are registered as an institution having ob object of general public utility, not falling under the any specific earlier clauses being education, being medical, relief to the poor, environment, preservation of monuments, etc., then you are not bound to get into areas of business and any, any activity that is the nature of business or assisting the business by way of a fee consideration, etc., will disentitle you to the exemption was an amendment made. Possible for certain setups to not get into not get into um, what you call away from all these activities and con and consequently in around 2012 an amendment retrospectively with effect from 14 2009 was made okay if you are doing only about 10 lakhs rupees in this gross receipts we are willing to give the exemption this got increased to 25 lakhs somewhere in 13 14 and around 16 they amended and said okay we permit you all to have 20% of your gross collections if the activity is incidental to your business and consequently you'll be able to take advantage of it. And this 20% is depending on your turnover. This is where probably trade bodies, chartered accountants and others should evaluate and probably file a memorandum to the central government to say that 20% flat may not be a very effective thing, basically because somebody is doing 10 lakhs or rupees gross receipts, doing some good charitable work, he can't do it more than 2 lakhs. Whereas somebody who has a turnover of 2 crores on account of historical reasons where the trust has come from over a period of time, will be able to do 2 crores. So this requires some reconsideration at an appropriate level. Fine tunings are a continuous process. Amendment to the Income Tax Act is a regular feature in the budget. And I'm sure the powers that are sitting in the North Block will probably take a cue and then make the thing more effective. What exactly is the decision in the case of Ahmedabad Urban Authority? It categorized the various aspects into effectively five, sorry, six types of organizations. It said, there are statutory corporations, authorities or bodies. What is the impact for them? There's, there is a BDA, there's a KADB, there's a Mangalore Urban Development Authority or, and all urban authorities across the country. Ahmedabad was the lead matter. And whether they fall under the head object of general public utility. Without doubt, all the registration under 12A or 12AA or 12AB are in respect of only object of general public utility. And consequently, all these type of entities will be entitled to claim benefit under Section 11, under the limb object of general public utility. When that is the position, automatically the first proviso and the second proviso to Section 215 will spring up. And consequently, we have to be on guard and watch ourselves for the uh, draconian 
I couldn't remember the right word for the harsh uh, consequences of not strictly adhering to the proviso. The proviso, there is a way of looking at it. If you have increased your receipts from these activities by one rupee more than what the 20% is, there is a possibility of you losing the entire exemption. Take, for example, to understand this concept better, KADB or BDA are organizations of statutory bodies and they are entitled to exemption. Two caveats have been put in respect of these bodies. One is that they should not make their transaction like a real estate person by marking up huge profits. The impact of cost plus a reasonable, very reasonable expense is what charity contemplates here. If you are trying to say that the cost is going to be 100 rupees, I'm going to load another 100 rupees, even these institutions in future will be under peril. Notwithstanding the fact that in the present judgment, all these uh, institutions have been com given complete relief in respect of the past years, but a caveat has been incorporated in clause H in the last few pages of the judgment has been set in this judgment, these institutions have to demonstrate year on year that their activities fall strictly under the head charity and do not take into account huge profiteering and consequently lose the exemption. Assume for argument's sake, though not conceding, if these institutions in the future years get into a situation where they need to fall into the uh, prohibited category of the proviso, that 20% limit will spring up and consequently, if they are well within the 20%, still they will continue to get the exemption. So in the entire scheme of the six categories that the judgment has evolved, as far as statutory corporations are concerned, it has clearly stated that being an organization created by the statute by the government for the welfare of the people, the element of profit motive is not there and consequently as long as these organizations do not have profit motive the question of giving denying them the exemption does not arise this is one very positive step in the judgment it has clearly said that authorities corporations or bodies established with the statute will definitely be excluded from the mischief of business or commercial receipt as long as they are reasonable and they are not unreasonable in respect of the various aspects. This is one of the positive developments for a lot of these corporations. But all these corporations have to also be on guard as in para B2 of the concluding part of the judgment at around page 140 or 142, the court has very clearly said it is not that there is a blanket, blanket permission for them to do what they want on each year and determine whether the consideration that have been charged by them is very higher than the cost or it's a nominal markup. If it's a nominal markup, then you are entitled to the benefit of section 11 and consequently all these organizations can take the benefit. If it is not nominal, but very significantly higher, then you will continue to be hit by the prohibition of proviso 1 to section 215 and then the overall limit of 20% of your turnover will spring up and this is the ratio as far as the organization attributable to the statutory organizations. Then we have the sports associations. There is a very interesting aspect as far as sports association is concerned. As we all know, sports associations are bodies which today, especially in the field of cricket, have a lot of financial power. These organizations are developing the sport of cricket. They also conduct various courses to train and coach not only cricketers, but the entire cricketing fraternity like umpires. However, it is to be noticed that this court in the present judgment has categorically held that sports association do not come under education, notwithstanding the fact they also grant a lot of certificates, specialized coachings 
for the umpires, the scorers, and other member trainers, uh, how to make a pitch. These are all expert advice, but then it does not look to me that these aspects have been greatly dwelt in by the uh, court on this accord, but clearly said they do not fall within the ambit of education. Why I'm emphasizing this is because if you fall under the limb of education, as I said, at the cost of reputation, the various limbs are education, medical relief, uh, uh, object of general public utility, relief to the poor. Object of general public is the last one. And the remaining two, watershed, environmental, I'll keep it out for the purpose of easy understanding. These four were there from a very long time. And sports associations claimed they not only fall under object of general public utility, but also have some amount of factor involved, which is for the purpose of education. Because education, this proviso limb will not come because the proviso limb comes only if you are registered as a trust falling within the fourth limb of object, that is object of general public utility. But, um, but for the court has categorically made an observation in certain paras, which I'm not able to recollect offhand, that the sports association will not fall under education. Then it has gone to the extent in from para 228 to 238 of the judgment exhaustively as what various types are there and what is capital subsidy, how the functioning of the sports association, state association, the central BCCI takes place. And as far as these decisions are concerned, they have reversed the orders with the Gujarat High Court in the case of Gujarat Cricket Association, but have left the option open in so far as these sports associations are concerned, they have remanded the matter back to the seeing officer for a second innings. I recall some judges when I used to practice a few years back telling, whenever you remand a matter, it is a case of punarapi jananam, punarapi maranam. It will again come back again over a period of time with new thought processes, new lawyers, new ideas, new judges, even into a new process in this. So there is some life as far as these trade sports associations are concerned. It is not completely gone for them. They have to demonstrate that their activities fall within the rational parameter of being reasonable amounts in so far as their costing is concerned. What are the and one other reason why the remanded was basically that the amount of money that has been spent by the Gujarat Cricket Association on development of cricket seem to be a very insignificant contribution. A para has been uh, written about it. But then there are associations like Bombay and in fact Karnataka, where I have an occasion to have a little more knowledge about it, spend a lot of amount on development of cricket. And consequently, the remand of the sports association back to the file of the assing officer will probably start a second innings, like what happens in cricket. It is no longer going to be 2020 or a one-day match. It's going to be a long drawn test match, starting from the toss once again with the assessing officer going over a period of time. The statutory regulators are the third type of people with the High Court, I mean, Supreme Court has dealt with. The Supreme Court has found that there are statutory regulators like seed authority or the Institute of Chartered Accounts of India. And for them, because they conduct courses, they are also coming under the object of general public utility. They conduct seminars, everything. As far as they are concerned, they have been given a clean chit and have said they are not hit by the proviso to section 215 of the act. And consequently, their actions do not fall foul of the provision. And consequently, the benefit will come subject to the final caveat, which I'll, which I'll come in the end. Then there are various trade associations like Apparel Export Promotion Council, ITPO, KPTO, KTPO, and various other institutions, which are also part of a batch of these editions. As far as these editions are concerned, they have said, what will come within the ambit of your exemption is a very limited amount. And if they provide great additional effort and technology and skill to provide 
knowledge to the their members are etc it is hit by the provision of 215 and it also says that providing rental spaces for fairs for trade shows consulting services all such activities will fall within the realm of being part of nature of business etc and consequently the exemption will not be entitled to and in the event they want to claim exemption they have to be within the proviso that is the limits that is specified of being 20 percent of the overall receipts then one small group of non-statutory bodies though they are not forming under the statute they have the gsi who give all this branding and uh, technology etc then there's irnet and nixi who are engaged engage in domain web etc and for them also they have said the markup that is required has to be very reasonable and otherwise the officer can look into it the last category is the private trust which don't fall into these spe special categories as far as these private trusts are concerned they have said they definitely fall within the object of general public utility and they cannot venture into business and consequently if they venture into business they are liable to be hit by the proviso however as a saving grace in respect of the petitioners who were before the supreme court in view of the very smallness of the amount involved they have not interfered with the relief granted by the high court notwithstanding the fact they have laid down the law that it is applicable for all private trust if suppose any of us form a private trust we are entitled to have to, are bound by the rules of 215 and if we contravene it there is a great amount of uh, uh, great amount of uh, what i can call difficulty in overcoming the proviso and liable to tax after finally after giving a summation of all the six aspects in the various uh, distinct entities the supreme court has actually culled out a special para called para h at page 146 which says notwithstanding what they are given all these things about whether they are statutory or non-statutory but they are not denied from claiming the exemption and the taxing authorities are de not denied from denying them exemptions in future on a year-to-year -year basis effectively it means that the decision that has happened will be applicable in respect of the transactions that have taken place and are before the supreme court in each of the if tomorrow kadb or uh, ahmedabad urban development authority who have got full relief in the judgment and the assessing officer of the said assessees are able to demonstrate that the markup is not nominal but very substantial then in the future years it can be denied it would be very apt for me to read that one para for the well benefit of the members so it will be clear in their thought process that this judgment notwithstanding it has given some findings in respect to the very six aspects it has left an area open for demonstration on a year to year basis the para h at page 146 effectively reads as follows at the cost of repetition it may be noted that the conclusions arrived at by way of this judgment neither precludes any of the assessee whether statutory or non-statutory advancing objects of general public utility from claiming exemption nor the taxing authority from denying exemption in, in the future if the receipt of the relevant year exceed the quantitative limit the assessing officer must on a yearly basis scrutinize the record to discern whether the nature of the SSE's activity amount to trade commerce or business based on its receipts and income and whether the amount charged are on cost basis or significantly higher if it is found that they are in the nature of trade commerce or business then it must be examined whether the quantified limit as amended from time to time in the proviso to 215 has been breached thus disentitling them to the exemption effectively this para concludes the question only in respect of the past periods in respect of these authorities in future if you continue to breach the principle laid down which is that you have to arrange your affairs and conduct an activity in a manner that is falling within the moral sense of charity and not charge very high amounts consequently the object would be 
not charity but profit motive profit motive and charity are something which are very some can say two sides of a coin they can walk like two parallel lines but if the object is only to make more money then in future notwithstanding the fact the relevant assessees have succeeded the assessing officer is entitled to scrutiny they made it very clear for a person who has not been given the relief he is entitled to demonstrate and for the person who has been granted the relief the assessing officer is able to demonstrate the principles have laid down that this is the position to take a few aspects of what the law on the subject which was earlier earlier the decision of the supreme court in surat art which was holding the fort had a great amount of what one would see as the binding decision which was being followed for a very long time the supreme court in the present occasion has said after the amendment to 215 the dominant activity of a charitable organization being charity is no longer what holds the fold it also has to be looked into from the view of the statutory modifications made by way of the proviso to 215 that is section 2 subsection 15 of the income tax act which clearly says that if you have been registered as a charitable trust under the limb objects of general public utility then you are bound by the provisos which will probably give you a very limited uh, time uh, space for you to maneuver your activities or you must completely excuse yourself against that activity and carry on only charitable activity what the objects of all these amendments and the way things are in this pipeline in fact they have issued a circular in the circular way back in 2008 they explained by saying that this entire amendment is for the purpose of only ensuring that persons don't make profit if there are no profit element if it's not trade or commerce or business it will not come so now the first question that have to be addressed in each of the issues if we dwell upon a question whether we will be hit or not first question each of us have to evaluate is whether which limb of charity we fall there are six limbs today which limb do we fall do we fall under the limb of education do we fall under the limb of medical relief relief to the poor watershed environment preservation of monuments last limb is object of general public utility if you fall under that limb and then your caution starts we have to be extremely cautious in how we proceed with the matter we, we cannot presume that what we do automatically is right if the intention is to make money under the guise of charity and apply it you are not entitled to it the thinking process over a period of time and the evolution of the revenues thinking and the government's policy ticking bodies evaluate a system by saying please do not think this charitable organization has to be has to a stepping stone for certain personal and progressive business thinking business growth these charitable organizations must be charitable in both with and substance letter and spirit and intent if these are absent it looks like that you are camouflaging your activity from what could be in the nature of a business to charity and trying to claim exemption to and consequently save the tax that would otherwise be payable if i have to evaluate this decision in a one more critical way i am of the view that one another important aspect has been not considered for whatever reasons have been not argued maybe argued not considered the point is if there is a contravention of the proviso to 215 of the act does the entity lose its exemption in its entirety or it loses only in relation to that part of the contravention to clarify it by an example 
let's assume an organization has under crores bank balance and it earns it's put in government bonds it earns 8 to 9 crores or be interest from government bonds which is definitely not coming within the purview of business trade or commerce for whatever reason there is a contravention of 131d or section 215 proviso by venturing into some business which has crossed the threshold limits contemplated under the proviso now does it mean that because we contribute here we have to pay tax on the interest income which has no whisper or no way related to the concept of business whether the entire income will go into a denial of exemption or it will be the that portion which has contravened in fact in this regard it would be appropriate to place before this august audience that there was a decision in the case of in the karnataka high court in the case of father muller and which probably also took note of the bombay high court decision in mafatlal's case which said that in case of contravention in section 13 because we all as students of tax understand 11 is a section which gives exemption section 13 is a section which gives certain condition precedent for getting the exemption if you violate section 13 then consequently you are not entitled to some exemptions there the courts have held that it is a contravening portion for example the karnataka court in the case of belimatta sabha melivetta sangha what it said was you are supposed to invest money only in fixed deposits or approved securities under 13 section 13 unknowingly some person has invested a money of let's say 5 lakhs rupees in a organization which is not specified under section 13 so revenues contention was no 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 you have contravened section 13 so your entire exemption under section 11 will go this aspect was negative and said no if at all anything has to go what has to go is only with reference to the contravened income now similarly when contravention of proviso to 12 when 215 springs up the issue is a plain reading at some times gives an impression the entire thing goes but there are no great detailed discussion on this aspect and i am sure people sitting in the north block will evaluate all these aspects and issue a proper guideline to the assessing officers so that these institutions are not put into peril this is a very very important aspect which requires consideration so thus the decision of the ahmedabad urban authority decision of the supreme court clearly enunciates a process by which it has analyzed six different types of entities which undergo which which carry on charitable activity for under the limb object of general public utility set you down and say something little lighter vein the day starts for me by reading poetry poetry is my first choice taxation is my second choice and i don't think so i know anything much more than that i read a very interesting poem in the morning today it's very apt for today's seminar or this panel discussion it's called the solitary reaper when somebody is singing and making harvest in that context the words run as follows she singing something will someone tell me what she sings perhaps the plaintive numbers flow of old unhappy far off things or battles long ago or is it some more humble lay familiar matter of today some natural sorrow loss or pain that has been and may be again it is very very apt today because these charitable institutions are in dire difficult position with natural sorrow earlier decisions future may be again they have no idea about it this decision is going to create a lot of difficulties interpretation issues because of clause h in the final thing where notwithstanding the relief given it is an open book to both sides to demonstrate what is right and what is wrong now the other decision 
I have not dwelt upon the entire 148 pages edition, uh, page by page or para by para. A lot of notes I made, but I probably feel that I've been given an hour's time and I have 12 minutes to probably finalize that in an half an hour session. So I'll try to see what exactly the other edition, which probably is also of some importance. <coughs> Both authored by the same judge of the Supreme Court. Both authored by the same judge. Now, in so far as the edition of the Supreme Court in Noble Education Society, it was an appeal by the SSE in respect of education, there are two or three methods by which one can claim exemption. One is the normal route of section 11, 12, 13, which I probably explained a little. It's a very, very vast subject. Probably so much intricacies are there, the subject it can go on for a whole day explaining the nuances of section 10, 11, 11 12, 13. Under 11, you are entitled to claim the benefit of exemption in respect of charitable institutions falling under the limb of education. As I said, charity includes education, medical, relief to the poor, leave the other two, object of general public utility. So education does not have the proviso. The proviso is applicable only in respect of institutions that fall or take the limb of oblic of general public utility. But the remaining three or the remaining five limbs, that proviso is not attracted. It's very, very on the plain reading itself, one can easily say so. There cannot be any quarrel about it, and nor the revenue has ever intended to interpret it to bring it under the other limbs. It has restricted itself to oblic of general public utility. In so far as education is concerned, the method by which a person can claim exemption is following this 11, 12, 13 route or make an application to the commissioner under section 1023C. There is a special earlier it was 10, section 1022. Now from 98, it became 1023C and consequently a approval will be granted for a specific period of time. And 1023C, any lawyer reads it, it is so complicated with all my experience, I have not been able to understand the great amount. It has, I think, according to me, 19 or 20 provisos in one subsection. It's a subsection of section 10, 23C, and it has 19 provisos on various aspects of it. So requires deep, patient, line by line reading to comprehend it. But in so far as the presentation is concerned, what they have said is they applied for 1023C and consequently they have been denied the exemption and the Supreme Court has upheld the, has upheld the denial of 1023C to the said institution. The various conclusions drawn are very different. For 1023C, one of the most important aspect is it should solely engage in educational activities. What is the meaning of the word solely has been exhaustively explained. It has overruled the two earlier editions of the Supreme Court, which is holding the fort in American lodging and in Queens. And in fact, as said, solely means, in fact, you cannot even do something beyond educational activities. Like for example, if you're running a hostel, it should be restricted to your students. If you're running a transport system to bring your students, it should be for your students. If you do something outside the system, it is not solely for education purpose. And the exhaustive definition of what education purpose solely means, which has been completely explained in it. Second is, it should be non-profit oriented. This is where the problem comes. Most educational institutions in our state have surpluses. And what is the surplus has been explained in TMFI, Islamia, Inamdar, the reasonable surplus can be 15%. But this judgment does not give what reasonable surplus is. Probably importing such concepts into it, if the amount of surplus, I mean, surplus means it is not the accountant terminology of 15% on your turnover, 
it should be cost plus 15%. The, if your cost is 100 rupees, you can overall collect 115 rupees. <coughs> that is how the addition on fee fixation and other things are there in the medical field. But what are the items of cost? Is again a debatable issue. Under the principles of accounting, there is a revenue stream, there is a capital stream. But for charitable trust, it is commercial accounting. And notwithstanding the fact that you make your accounts on revenue stream wise, for the purpose of Income Tax Act, even a capital expenditure incurred will be considered as expense and a method of depreciation or amortization will be considered. So this judgment clearly says you must, if it is profit oriented, you should not be given the benefit of 1023C. There's not much of discussion on 11, 12, 13 in this judgment, except some reference to section 11, 4A, which is nature of business. And in fact, some of the submissions of the government revenue have clearly enunciated following TMA pi that education is not something in the nature of profit. It is charity. That portion has been succinctly, clearly, categorically submitted by the uh, government ASG. And consequently, one aspect of it will go in our favor. But however, the, the surplus that accrues year after year per se, that if generated with very huge amount, then whether it amounts or not is one question mark for the purpose of 1023C. Section 11 has not been greatly evaluated. But in clause C at page 50 of the judgment, they made a passing reference to 114A, which deals with business incidental too. So, but I would feel the most of the educational institutions that run in the system in the various states in our country, more so in Karnataka, will have the main object is education. And most of them would not be making huge monies on these buses and hostels and things like that. So consequently, the 4A will come for an incidental business activity. And incidental business activity has been explained to say that if you are doing it for your own students, it is not hit by it. And consequently, some sort of a relief is there for the business, I mean, the educational clan. The seventh proviso to 23C deals with what you can do and what you cannot do, what is incidental and what is not incidental. The difficult part of it for the SSC clan is they have also used the words 114A, which is by and large identical to the, if you take the stream of section 1112, you have to see that you are not hit under 114A. If you are taking the benefit under 1023C, you have to take a view that you don't fall under the seventh proviso. As they have explained both in a common para and some few common pages, there is a very great apprehension among the educational institutions and its community and fraternity that even if you follow the section 11, 12, 13 route, there is a possibility of uh, you be denying the exemption based upon some of the observations of this court. They expressly overruled Queens and, Amer and American lodging and those things do not be any more good law. They have restricted themselves to 1023C in para F at page 50 to clearly say that what exactly you have to do and not to do for the purpose of getting exemption. Lastly, as the decision of Noble went from the state of Andhra Pradesh, there is an act in Andhra Pradesh which expects every charitable institution to every charitable institution to register themselves with that. So these SSEs took a contention before the Supreme Court for the purpose of Income Tax Act, whether I'm registered in the State Act or not is not to be looked into, but whether I comply with the provisions of the Income Tax Act is what has to be looked into and nothing more. The court has negative the thought process, that arguments and said that if a State Act has been enacted for the purpose of ensuring the charitable trust are regulated. And if you do not have the registration and you don't comply with the various uh, terms, various clauses and uh, the provisions of the said act, you can be denied under the Income Tax Act is one aspect which we need to worry. And this is probably only under the, as far as Karnataka is concerned, to the best of my knowledge, there's no governing body as far as the Trust Act is concerned. But if the 12A is registered for a society, 
there's a slight registration act and consequently some of the educational institutions which may fall into this aspect because of the fact that they might have been registered as a society. Keeping all these aspects, the 1023C approval which is rejected by the commission has been upheld. But the biggest saving grace, which is importantly be noticed by everybody, is the last para at page 78 of the judgment. And I feel every practicing tax practitioner must read this judgment and make sure that it gets imbibed in his RAM memory at all point of time. This is very, very important. I would like to read that in a very succinctly, they have given relief to the SSE for the past. This court is further of the opinion that since the present judgment has departed from the previous rulings regarding the meaning of the term solely in order to avoid disruption and to give time to institutions likely to be affected to make appropriate changes and adjustments, it would be in the larger interest of society that the present judgment operates hereafter. As a result, it is hereby directed that the law declared in the present judgment shall, shall operate prospectively. The appeals are hereby dismissed without order to cost. So that means we the educational institution can be rest assured that up to assessment year 22, 23, where they have filed the returns and taken a particular position will not be disturbed, but each one of them have to evaluate their strength and weaknesses based on the judgment to see what is right for them for the assessment year 23, 24 going forward, failing which there would be definitely an <coughs> impact on their financials on account of the tax burden, for tax burden that will arise on account of this judgment. See, in a scheme of taxation, there's a very old saying. Lord Sanders once said, scoundrels and scalvets have also to pay tax like a normal person, but they get the desert somewhere. The desert is somewhere. If they contravene some law, the desert is under that law. And if you have to pay tax, that's how the decision of the Supreme Court in Pierre Singh, Qureshi. Pierre Singh was a smuggler. He was smuggling gold. So income tax department said, no, you have to pay tax on it. He said, okay, I will pay tax on it. But then the gold sellers confiscated uh, some 10 kgs of my gold. Please allow that as a cost. Then the income tax department said, no, 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 we will not allow that as a cost because it is illegal activity. At that point of time, probably 30, 40 years back when I was not even in practice, Supreme Court said, no, no, no. That's uh, for doing smuggling, you will get this desert elsewhere. Under the Income Tax Act, the, 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 the loss of gold is a loss entitled to exemption or deduction under the scheme of the Act. So in this background, all these educational institutions have to understand that the policy of the government at this point of time, especially the educational institutions, is not to make this edu educational institution as profit centers for personal gain. This is the message that clearly comes from the decision. Basically because in real practice, most of us are aware that some of these institutions, though on record charitable, off record looks like have their own agenda. Setting, at the, setting up aside, setting that aside apart, it is essential that in view of the judgment, solely for if you are coming under section 1023C, you must fall within the strict words of solely for educational purposes in both with substance, letter, spirit. If you fail, there's a very good chance you'll be hauled up under the provision. What happens if a person is adopting section 11 route? It's a wonderful guess, which I do not want to do at this point of time. I think I am at 7.33 now. Basuraj, I, it's maybe one glimpse of the judgment I have given to people. And before concluding, I want to only say the great words of George Jessel, who beautifully said, the mind starts functioning, the mind starts functioning when a child is born and stops when it faces an audience, more so a virtual audience. Thank you, gentlemen, for giving me a patient hearing. <clears throat> that was a magnificent <clears throat> piece, sir. Now, coming back to the uh, Karnataka issue, uh, let me give some 
factual and legal antecedents so that we will have a full fledged uh, brainstorming session with uh, mr shankar sir now under the karnataka municipal corporation act no section 110 deals with exemption to educational institutions from payment of property tax now section 110 says the following buildings and lands shall be exempted from property tax building or lands exclusively used for students hostel which are not established or conducted for profit educational purposes by recognized educational institutions now there is subsection 2 which provides for uh, 25% of the property tax towards the service charges providing basic amenities roads etc now section 110 specifically says three aspects one is exclusively used for educational purposes and without any profit and also not conducted for uh, profit and recognized educational institutions now so far as exclusively used for educational institution purposes is concerned uh, i represent some of the uh, cbse icse and international schools my personal experience is i do not think that the educational institution use their building for any other purposes except for educational purposes now there may be parking areas and uh, there may be staff quarters and the kerala uh, the judgment from the kerala supreme court has said even students uh, hostels are exempted from payment of property tax under the kerala municipal corporation act in karnataka karnataka municipal corporation act uh, section 110 subsection 1 subsection a specifically says students hospitals which are not established or conducted for profit now karnataka municipal Car- uh, municipality act now what i read is karnataka municipal corporation act now karnataka municipality act section 94 of the act deals with exemption of property tax to the educational institutions directly it says that the following buildings and vacant sites <coughs> vacant lands shall be exempted from property tax namely buildings or vacant lands exclusively used for student hostels which are not established or conducted for profit and educational purposes by recognized educational institution now we dealt with as i indicated for example if you take bangalore bangalore metropolitan area bangalore metropolitan city for example the core area is bangalore metropolitan city which comes within the jurisdiction of the bangalore city corporation the brahmat bangalore mahanagara palike then bangalore metropolitan area which comes within the jurisdiction of bangalore development authority then bangalore metropolitan region that comes within the jurisdiction of bangalore metropolitan region development authority bmrda and bangalore international airport area planning authority in that area within this bangalore metropolitan region there are several town planning pockets like nanmangala planning authority anekal and oskote planning authority beyond that is the gram panchayat area now what i read covers the bangalore metropolitan city bangalore metropolitan area and also bangalore metropolitan region because it comes even within the uh, jurisdiction of karnataka municipalities act also now coming to karnataka panchayat raj act see the difference section 119 says the levy of taxes rates by gram panchayat every gram panchayat shall in such manner and subject to such exemption as may be prescribed and not exceeding so and so so and so now prescribed we all know prescribed by rules now rule 6c provides exemption for buildings and lands solely used for charitable or public religious purposes and not let out for rent under subsection 1 of section 119 now both karnataka municipalities act karnataka municipal corporation act uh, act gives exemption to educational institutions provided they are exclusively used for educational purposes and without any profit now karnataka panchayat raj act uses the word charitable purposes this is where we are stuck uh, before the honorable uh, karnataka high court of course in the earliest judgment of the karnataka high court which was delivered on 13th of december 1985 in the matter of the town municipal council mulki versus vijaya college mulki that is writ petition number 5381 of 1979 decided on 13th december uh, 1985 exhaustively considered as to whether the buildings are exclusively 
used for educational purposes can be considered as uh, charitable for the purpose of exemption under section 94 of the then municipalities act now kindly see the the later amendment uh, under the karnataka municipalities act is because of the judgment delivered by the karnataka high court earlier under section 94 the words used were similar to the words which are used under the karnataka panchayat raj act that's a charitable purpose now the supreme court relied on the Sidraj Bhai Sabai versus State of Gujarat, the sole trustees, uh, Loka Shikshana Trust and Commission of Income Tax Mysore, and all these uh, judgments were exhaustively laid on. And Karnataka High Court said it comes within the meaning of charitable activities and exemption was granted. It was taken in appeal and the writ appeal was dismissed. Subsequent to that, the act was amended. Now, there are two or three judgments of the Hanbal Supreme Court, the TMA Pai Foundation versus State of Karnataka, the 2002 8 SEC 481. And uh, PA Inamdar. Inamdar and Islamic Academy deals with the professional colleges, whereas the TMA Foundation starts from LKG up to professional colleges. Now, there are two more judgments of the Honorable Supreme Court in the matter of Rajasthan Educational Institutions versus uh, Union of India, challenging the validity of the right of children to free and compulsory education act 2009. And there is a constitution bench judgment of the Honorable Supreme Court in the matter of Pramati Educational Institution. Now, even under the RTE Act <clears throat> 2009, there are three categories of schools. Schools run by the local authorities, schools run by the governmental uh, uh, government itself, and third one is the private educational institution. Now, government schools are run by the education department. Local authority schools are run by the municipalities, etc., or Jilla Panchayat, as the case may be. And the last one is the private educational institutions. So for the first two layer is concerned, there shouldn't be any problem. Now, private educational institutions in the state of Karnataka, I must say, having the personal knowledge, there are several categories. One is a state school, second one is a CBSC school, third one is ICSC schools, fourth one is international schools. Now, first three categories are to be registered under the Karnataka Education Act 1983 which came into force on 1st June 1995 after the receipt of the president ascent after uh, 10 years. Now, international schools are neither under the Karnataka Education Act nor under the CBSC or ICAC. Now, some of the educational institutions, of course, I advise them and some take my advice, are charging slightly exorbitant fees. Uh, I I can say some educational institutions charge more than two to three lakhs per year, where uh, my and I, I hope uh, Mr. Shankar's also entire education up to LLB was completed within about 15,000, maybe less than that. Entire education from standard one to LLB. Now, these schools are charging more than one lakh, two lakh, and even more than that. I do not know. Now, hang with regard to the judgment of the Supreme Court now delivered, though these schools exclusively use the buildings for educational purposes there is no problem about it because the buildings are not let out buildings are not used for any commercial purposes but the profit angle i think the educational institutions will have a serious uh, question to be answered because under the karnataka panchayat raj act the word used is charitable and karnataka municipal corporations act and karnataka municipalities act the word used is <coughs> those institutions are not making profit. Now, under the BBMP Act 2020, the, the exemption is completely taken out. And because of that, we have challenged the constitutional validity of the BBMP Act in so far as it uh, uh, removes the exemption uh, being granted to the educational institutions in the uh, city of uh, Bangalore. Because, uh, for example, uh, Bangalore, uh, uh, BBMP, uh, jurisdiction, Brahad Bengaluru Mahanagara Kapaliki jurisdiction, the educational institutions will not have exemption. Whereas the very same uh, corporation, for example, Mangalore Corporation or Hubli Darwad Corporation, they come under the Karnataka Municipal Corporations Act 1976 and they get exemption. Therefore, the violation of Article 14 of the Constitution of India is uh, writ large and the matter is pending consideration. Now, I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Shankar, sir, what is the effect of the judgment on the international uh, sir i wanted to ask this question what is the yes sir. uh there are sir you can unmute yourself and yeah now what is the effect of uh, this judgment 
on the international cbse icse schools which are charging slightly on a higher uh, scale when it comes to exclusive usage of the building for the purpose of education there shouldn't be any problem because all these schools are uh, using the building for exclusively educational purposes when it comes to fee structure many of the schools are charging not for revenue plus for the future growth something beyond that that is where we are stuck so what is your advice to the educational institutions who charge a slightly higher fee uh, kindly unmute yourselves yes yes sir i am audible yes sir can you briefly your question is basically what is the impact of the judgment on the schools which charge little more than what they should normally charge whether it will have an impact on them or not i i i'll uh, say straight away come yes, to the yes. under the karnataka education act now there is some stupid formula salary plus 30% to, uh, divided by number of students would was the fee structure later salary plus 70% then salary plus 80% now salary plus 100% divided by number of students is the fee structure within the bangalore metropolitan city outside okay. is bangalore um, salary plus 80% divided by number of student now the cbse and icse schools were exempted under the karnataka education act when the act was uh, promulgated in 1995 the president gave an assent only on the ground that you should exclude cbse and icse schools in 1998 karnataka uh, legislature amended excluding these schools <clears throat> now after 20 25 years these schools are sought to be included within the karnataka education act and we have challenged there is an entry model uh, that the, the karnataka basically as and today Karnataka Education Act is not applicable to CBSE, ICSE, and international schools. Now, the under the CBSE regulation, there it is very vague. Now, taking advantage of this, rightly, these schools are charging a fee structure which may be bordering on uh, exorbitant uh, fee structure. So, what is your advice to these educational institutions tomorrow if auditing takes place? Because in one school, um, uh, notices are already issued. Show me your bank statement. show me your fee structure for last so many years and show me the income you generated and the expenditure incurred by you uh, so for the surplus amount is concerned therefore what is your advice to these educational institutions because in another 2 years or 3 years uh, down the line if the act is upheld and these schools are all you know taken to task <laughs> what is your advice to uh, these no, schools, i will i will phrase your question yes sir a few aspects Yes, sir. First aspect is there is now a state law. Yes, sir. Which purports to govern the CBCI and international schools also, which has been stayed by the High Court for the time being. Yes, sir. Now the ultimate womb of future is very uncertain. Yes, sir. In the law of the Supreme Court, in so far as noble is concerned, yes, sir. If there is a state law which you have to comply, you have to comply. Mm. There cannot be any uh, doubt about it. because para g at page 51 in noble has very clearly said you have to comply now the formula that you are giving me for the purpose of compliance in respect of a school is 70% plus 100% percent i am i'm sorry sir now what we are doing is for last 3 years for example from 2019 onwards because of the entry matter we are charging the fee structure as we were charging earlier So i understand tomorrow if the books of account are reopen what do, what should we do uh, what precaution should we take now no, the, you, are you asking a precaution under the income tax act or under the, under the your uh, so what applies to income now the problem is and uh, i will ask you very uh, in, in a nutshell what applies to these schools under the income tax act applies even under the uh, uh, property tax both exclusively is used for educational purposes and charitable angle so tomorrow if uh, retrospectively if they try to open the book saying that uh, what you have done is complete commercialization uh, now that we are not collecting as per the karnataka education what what should we do because some of the questions as 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 a, as a born optimist and a person who always believes that things are there we have to take shelter in para 78 the noble judgment and say whatever decision you do has to be prospective when they are given away under the income tax act last 20 years you why you should not give the benefit is precisely what we need to address that is why i always said every tax practitioner should read para 78 of the noble judgment and keep that in his ram memory at any point of time that the decision is likely to have this he has to articulate this proposition to ensure 
that it is not retrospectively taxed. Yes. That is one way of looking at it. The other way of looking from tax, from the income tax angle in entirety is income tax angle has not prescribed salary plus 100% and all those norms are not there. In so far as medical education is concerned, the TMAPI, Islamia and Inamdar has very clearly said 15% is reasonable surplus, taking into account revenue expenditure plus capital expenditure. Because under the way of computing income for a trust, it is not the revenue expenditure alone that is allowable. In that context, I, Prima Fesi, without knowing the full details, would like to advise people who have uh, taken such contentions in the uh, Corporation Act and the CBA Schools Karnataka Education Act to also challenge the power of the state to just fix it 100%, which is contrary to TMAPI. That we have done. That we have that, done. That contention should have been taken. Yes. And let us see how it happens. As well as if, if after a few years, if a law gets changed, see, there are two judgments. In one judgment, they are not given retrospective. One judgment, they are given retrospective. They say it's only prospective. So we have to ensure that this sort of articulated thing that it will completely collapse the educational system of these schools. And consequently, this decision may be considered prospective. There, are, there is a reasonable chance of professionals succeeding in the matter. Yes, sir. Now, uh, I throw upon the question and answer session. Uh, all of you can uh, unmute yourself and also start the video camera and ask the questions. I think I'm audible. Uh, you can raise your hand or you can straight away unmute yourself and ask the questions. Any questions from the audience? I think, am I audible, sir? I can hear you. I don't know about others. Yeah, Mr. Vijay Kumar, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. You can start the video as well. Mr. Vijay Shankar, uh, Mr. Vijay Kumar, you can, uh, you are, you are, you are unmuted. You can start the video or you can ask the questions right away. Or Mr. SR, I can see. SR has to unmute. Yes, I have asked him to unmute. Mr. Vijay Kumar, please unmute yourself and you can ask the question to Mr. Shankar. Uh, sir, I am a VS Kumar here. Yes, sir. Oh, Mr. Indus School. Yes, sir. Yeah. See, uh, uh, actually, we are a trust where we don't claim any exemption as uh, a charitable institutions. We have few other charitable trusts that is different, but the main school, we don't uh, claim ourselves uh, the benefit and uh, as a charitable institution, we pay tax normally. So, and we run only education as a business. So, are we affected by this judgment, sir? If you're already paying tax, in fact, according to you, you'll be affected by the principle on the Education Act. Unless you are a charitable trust, you are not entitled to run an institution. You have to look at it from that angle. From the tax angle, if you're paying tax, the revenue is not worried. Okay. As long as you pay tax, they'll be happy to collect it and be okay. comfortable. But then you have to please examine professionally whether such a thing is practically possible in reality under the Education Act. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Mr. Rachna Talwar. Yeah, uh, sir, I have a question that uh, if you're saying that the building has to be used only for education purposes, now normally what happens is schools are using the building for selling out uniforms, books, you know, fairs, symposiums, annual days where they collect money for all kinds of activities. Now, even though it is a minuscule amount apart from the education, that is point number one. Point number two is the way you have a, a, a calculating formula in Karnataka on the determination of the fees. There is certain kind of a formula also available in Delhi to calculate the fees. So now uh, prospectively taking into consideration, will all these schools have to rework their entire strategy for uh, such kind of one activities on selling of uniforms, uh, you know, all those kind of activities and the fees which is attached to it. Uh, I, can I take the question, sir? 
Yeah. See, under the Karnataka Education Act and the rules, basically, strictly speaking, the Karnataka Education Act was borrowed from the Delhi Education Act. What did they simply cut and paste in 1983? So that is why the President of India kept the file for next 10 years and it was given, the consent was given only in 1995. Now, under the Karnataka Education Act and the rules, uh, curricular rules, the schools cannot uh, compel the students to purchase the uniform and books from their educational premises. It should be voluntary. Sometimes, for example, in uh, international schools like Indus of Mr. Kumar, they have, ex uh, they have exhibited the uniform in the school premises. And they say, this is the uniform. If you want to buy, you can buy from here. Or if you go outside and buy, it should be similar to this. Or it should be identical to this. Therefore, in Karnataka, you cannot compel the students to purchase the uniform and books within the school premises. If it is made voluntary, that means if you have a sh small shop or outlet in the school where the students and the parents can purchase the books and uniform voluntarily, then you are you come within the meaning of exclusively used for educational purposes. Not otherwise. Anyway, in Karnataka, there is no compulsion. You cannot compel the parents to buy the books and uniform only by the from the school. Thank you, sir. Answered. Yeah. Uh, can I take, okay. can I ask questions? Sure, sure. Good evening, sir. Mr. Yes, sir. Who, who is that? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Kindly uh, show. State Don't know why he is coming. Name name apologies. Place. Kindly state your name and place. Because this. Sure. I'm, my, my, my name is Sudarshan Rangan. I'm from Chennai. Yes, sir. Uh, so my, my question to Mr. Shankar, I have a couple of questions uh, on this uh, these judgments. One, uh, sir, uh, um, now, you know, the Surat Art Silk, uh, which is heavily relied upon, which has been overruled, the five-member five judgment. Um, see, I, I believe, you know, what it essentially says is when you do a trade commerce uh, activity, uh, it is at the end of the day means to an end and not an end itself, which unfortunately, I believe the, the Ahmedabad judgment seemed to have not appreciated it. Uh, what is your view on that? Uh, my second question is, uh, on the Loka Sikshana Trustee, which is a 1970 judgment on education, which talks about scholastic formal, and we do have a dissent from Justice Beg on that. Now, my only concern is, uh, are we still very archaic in, in, in narrowing the scope of education? Because as you rightly mentioned, when you take cricket, uh, sports as an education, and, and today sports is a mainstream, uh, you know, I, I don't even need to give an example of Sachin Tendulkar, but the fact of the matter is today people taking that as a career and many such non-formalistic way of education are keeping up. So uh, do you think the Supreme Court has been unfortunately been myopic in reducing and approving Lok Sikshana? They could have probably overruled it and give a different way, for example, in museums, etc. These are my two questions. Thank you. See, yeah, so the first question is concerned on Suraj Art. We have to appreciate that Suraj Art and Loka Sikshana, all of them were, see, Loka Sikshana was giving, deny, giving benefit even under the old act, section 43 of the 1922 act. Whereas now they have very clearly written a para in the judgment by saying all these decisions are with, without the express proviso to section 215 of the act and that interpretation is not there. And consequently, that is why they have not, oh, if you look at the last para of the judgment, they have overruled only Queens and uh, the other decision, the Queens and the American lodging. They have not said the three bench can never overrule a decision of the five bench. What they have said is the rationale behind Loka Sikshana, I mean, by Surat Art was dominant purpose is very important. Now the dominant purpose statutorily has been diluted. If you look at Loka Sikshana, I mean, uh, Surat Art, it came in 75, 76, and 78 itself, they brought in one section called 13.1 BB of the Income Tax Act. Again in 84, they removed it and they brought in 11 4A of the Income Tax Act. All these things have been in detail explained. I do not feel on my reading, after all, I spent only three, four hours reading the judgment and not been able to run through all the judgment microscopically, which runs to more than 1300 pages. But from officially, my view is that, that this judgment has taken the law as on date into account to arrive at a conclusion that the dominant purpose is no longer there. When, when the statute has clearly said, now dominant, if, without the proviso, they could not have overruled, they could not have taken the view of local sectiona and then uh, diluted the uh, Surat Art because it's five batch. Now the law has undergone a change and then very categorical they have said 
that if you fall under the fourth limb, you have to not have trade commerce or in the nature of trade commerce. That answers probably both your questions. If you have any supplementaries, welcome. Please. Yes, sir. Uh, but, uh, sorry, uh, but my only uh, uh, the, the, the rebuttal is the 215, which they have also mentioned unless the context otherwise requires. Yes. So that is where my concern comes in. I I totally appreciate from a you know literal interpretation even when the, the judgment has talked about interpretation. But I believe they could have also used the 215, uh, you know, unless the context otherwise, to look at what exactly which Surat art I felt elucidated in a much better fashion. I, I you know, I'm, I'm just trying to wear a devil's advocate here, you know, mm. uh, without looking at, but you, you know, the amount of impact that's going to have, because I, in my, in my view, this judgment, even though has at least to a large extent cleared, but I believe it has opened up a completely new Pandora's box, the amount of litigation that is going to throw up in terms of. You know, sir, how things work. So that was my only concern. I said it is not answered or clarified. And it is okay, fine. This is this is it should be, and I leave it to the assessing officers could make each case. And then you know, again going back, what what now we'll have a new set of judgments coming in. What is marginal cost? Up? What is the nominal markup? What is uh, again education? I I, I I believe we we are in for as you rightly said, you know, another new set of round of litigation. This is never going to end. I mean, there's unfortunately no ease of doing charity. If you, if you go to page 70 of the judgment para B, 123, 124 onwards, they have completely examined the phrase unless the context otherwise requires. And they've also cited a lot of decisions on it right from the NK Jain judgment and the SK Gupta judgment and categorically said and other section does not give them the impression the context otherwise submits. If unless, the point is unless the context otherwise requires means that when you read section 11, it should give a different impression. Prama Faisali, I also concur with the rationale that when you read section 11 to 13, you do not get a context otherwise than what is said in 215. To say that 215 should not be applied to 11 because the context does not suggest so would, will take away the entire purpose object of the amendment to 215. I understand that there's going to be a lot of litigation then litigation has been the bone of contention. As professionals, we have to say Anna Dada Suki Bhava. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you very much. Sir. Mr. Yesar, you are a lawyer? Hello. Good evening, sir. Yes, yes, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. Sir. Uh, uh, this only one this is regard. Um, uh, you're practicing on the tax side or what? Uh, yes, sir. I'm, 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 I'm practicing on the tax. My name is Sudarshan. I'm, sorry, I don't know. I'm unfortunately reflecting as I sir. Yeah, My yeah, name is Sudarshan. Um, I will contact you in person. The next seminar would be on you. So you have to get ready to speak on you for the Karnataka State Bar Council Academy. Okay. More than happy. To. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank Mr. you very much, Shankar. Yeah. Mr. Good evening, sir. Mr. Vijay Kumar. Yeah. So this has reference to para 73 of uh, Noble Education Society judgment, mm -hmm. uh, wherein uh, they have barred uh, educational institutions uh, for letting out the infrastructure to another educational institution also mm -hmm. under uh, 1023C basically. But mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, in case of uh, 2LA trust, what are the consequences if it lets out uh, uh, say, like seminar hall to an, uh, another uh, education institution or in case of 12 trust which is running uh, owning a community hall gives it on hire to uh, uh, general public or uh, in case of a 12 registered trust which has got uh, properties which is given on rent whether it will amount to business and uh, hit by the pro pro uh, findings in para 73 of that order please read 72 also and then you, uh, your answer is there mm. Can I read 72 for you? You'll be able to appreciate it better. When, what then is incidental business activity in relation to education? Imparting education through schools, colleges, and other such institutions would per se be charity. They are given you categorical. Apart from that, there could be activities incidental to providing education. One example is textbooks. This quote in the previous ruling in so-and-so, so-and-so has held that dealing in textbooks is part of larger educational activity. The court was concerned with the state established institution that published and sold textbook. It was held that if an institution facilitate learning of its pupils by sourcing and providing textbook, such activity would be incidental to education. Similarly, if a school or other educational institution ran its own buses and provided bus facility or transport section, that too would be an activity incidental to education. There can be similar instances such as providing summer camps for pupils, special education courses such as relating to computers, etc., which may benefit its pupils in their pursued learning. Categorical. Now, 
you are talking of 73. However, where institution provide their premises or infrastructure to other entities, trust societies, etc., for the purpose of conducting workshops, seminars, or even educational courses, with the concerned trust is not actually imparting, and outsiders are permitted to enroll in such seminar, workshop, or courses, then the income derived from such activity cannot be corrected as part of education or incidental to imparting education. Such income can properly fall under the other head of income. That is the, the two aspects to it. They have not said because of this, you will be, first of all, this is applicable to 11, 12 itself is another debate in my Prama FCU, it is not applicable. Assume for argument's sake, it is applicable. They have not said it will disentitle to you. That is why in my course of my initial submissions, I clearly said, the addition of the father Muller, in such case, the worst scenario would be the net income arising out of that activity fall under other head of income is what they have said. Maybe you have to pay tax on that is the worst scenario according to me, which I, I feel is not very clear as far as 11 and 12 trusts are concerned. But the department is bound to incorporate plus 73 for 11 and 12 and this is how, as rightly pointed out by Sudarshan, there is going to be one more round of litigation going on in this regard. Sir, uh, this uh, again, uh, with regard to so if, uh, they have said uh, not providing infrastructure to other institutions which uh, the trust is not imparting is treated as not, not incidental. Whether it will be covered under specified violation under section 12 AB because uh, the business is not incidental to the objects of the trust. See, that way 12 A is a very draconian section. If you look at 12 AA4, if you have the act, kindly have a look at section 12 AA4. Fortunately, what 12 AA4 says, 12 AA4 or 12 AB4, it's a very interesting section which got amended in 2014. Without pro prejudice to the provisions of subsection 3, where a trust or an institution has been granted registration under clause B of subsection 1 or has obtained registration at any time under clause 12A, as it stood before the amendment to so and so, and subsequently it is noticed that the activities of the trust or institution are being carried out in a manner that the provisions of section 11 and 12 do not apply to exclude either whole or in any part of the income of such trust or institution due to operation of subsection 1 of 13. This clause, in my opinion, is a very draconian section because the word used are whole in part. As I was explaining to you all, Father Muller was a, a position where they say there is some contravention, you, you, you attack the contravention and pay tax. But for denying you the exemption and cancelling, both under 12A and 12AB, a similar section is there which says that if there is a contravention of section 11, if you contravene 215, there is a contravention of section 11. And conspicuously, 13 is not there in this section. So, but they will say if you contravene 13, 11 gets contravened and consequently the denial can happen. So, this is a possibility that it can happen. That is my prima facie view at this point of time. Sir, sir, sir. Rent yeah, please. Uh, whether renting of a building, will it be considered as a business or it is covered under uh, income from property of the trust? See, as far as trusts are concerned, there is a very interesting decision of the Supreme Court in 56 ITR or thereabout. There is nothing called business income. All income of the trust actually be assessed as income from other sources. But then in practice, it has not been being, I, I practiced 20 years as a chartered accountant before I ventured into law. So in reality that if, you, if a trust rents out a property, you don't come under the education aspect, correct? You have let out a property which has been evolved over a period of time out of ob object of general public utility. So then you have to look at how your decision will apply to Ahmedabad and then take a call on it. Lot, last para of Ahmedabad will apply as far as that is concerned because there is nothing prohibited in law. You are not entitled to 1023C if you have any object other than education. That is why Noble clearly says if you don't have, if you have anything other than education, you don't come within the ambit of uh, charity there. So if you have other object, don't get 1023C at all. But in so far as 11, 12 and 13 is concerned, you can continue to do all the six limbs of charity. I am running an educational institution. I want to do watershed. I want to do environment. I want to run a hospital. Each can be a different wing. And as long as books separately are maintained, I do not foresee a situation where an interpretation can be placed that one trust cannot have more than one limb. Because definitely when 12 years are given, you are clearly saying what you want to do. And ultimately, 
your records and accounts must clearly show which activity falls under which aspect. And you have to ensure if you come under objects of general public utility. Suppose you are, a trust runs a school and also it runs a kalanamanta for poor. The Ahmedabad said, for poor, if you don't charge any money and give them free, you are not hit by it for a kalanamanta. is very clearly said so. The trust says that I had money. I want to, I am running a school in my area. I want to give benefit to the area of my rural area. I built a chow tree and I'm giving free of cost or at some very insignificant amount. Just because they fall under both the limbs, you cannot deny me education under section 11 under 11 is my, why say Pramav is a very strong view on the matter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you, I hope I clarified. You want some more clarity? Vijay Kumar? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if you want any more clarity, you're welcome to call me. Mm. Mm. I think uh, that was a magnificent uh, speech by Mr. Shankar, Senior Advocate, Bangalore.